Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Martin and this is section 23 of the novel 910 by Nora Raleigh Baskin. This section is taking place in Columbus, Ohio. And that means that the character we will be visiting with is Nahid. Now, as always, we direct our attention to our setting and it is September 11th at 1045 AM. There are some significant events that have occurred that, uh, since we've last seen Nahid, that we did see depicted in some of the other sections. So two sections ago, uh, we saw Sergio witness at 9.59 a.m. the collapse of the South Tower, which is also known as Tower 2. And additionally, in the last section, we saw Will witness the crash of Flight 93. Additionally, what was not covered in the book is that at 1010, the part of the Pentagon that was impacted by the plane collapsed. And sadly, at 1028, Tower 1, which is the North Tower, collapsed. So this is fitting in right afterwards. And again, Columbus, Ohio, nowhere near most of these things. But let's also keep in mind that this attack, while it was going on, had so much media coverage that people all over the world, not just in the United States, saw play by play what was going on. And so you had events taking place in New York and in Washington, D.C. and in Pennsylvania. And this was going on the news pretty constantly. And so adults began to panic because, again, we did not know what was going on. We did not know when the attack would stop. And so for the adults, this was a, a, a huge uh, issue of uncertainty and feeling unsafe no matter where you lived in America. And so we're going to see how that plays out in Nahid's world in Columbus, Ohio. What was happening? Why? Parents had started showing up to get their kids and take them home. Just a few at first, then a few more. One girl from Mrs. Salinger's class got called down to the office and another mom showed up right at the classroom door. She looked like she had been crying. She asked for her daughter and they were gone. Something bad had happened in New York City. But why everyone was so upset, no one could really say. None of the teachers were interested in teaching anything. And after a while, it felt oddly like a snow day, an in-school snow day on the warmest, clearest, most beautiful day of the year. Nahid moved from one period to the next with the rest of her classmates, who were mostly undisturbed and mostly glad not to be taking tests or giving reports or whatever they thought they were going to have to do that morning. No one was explaining what was going on. Until... An announcement came over the PA that there was to be an entire sixth grade assembly in the library in five minutes. Seventh graders were to report to the auditorium, eighth graders to the cafeteria immediately. So I've highlighted a few clues that just let us know what Nahid has seen so far. We know far more than she does right now. And the fact that we as an audience know more than our character in the story is a little something called dramatic irony. So she's got puzzle pieces. We have the whole picture. And those puzzle pieces for her are simply that something bad has happened. Adults are crying. Teachers are upset. No one's explaining what's going on. So she's hoping to get some answers at the assembly. Did you hear anything? Tommy came up next to Nahid as they were making their way down the hall toward the library. I'm not sure, Nahid said. I think it's about a bomb in New York City, 
Tommy said. It was a plane. Another boy from their grade came up beside them. Mr. Numerovsky let us have the radio on in math class, he said. It was a huge plane, and it was on purpose. That's a lie, Tommy said. That's not true. Oh, yeah? The boy kept walking forward, but looked back over his shoulder at them. Then why do you think we're having this big assembly? Just to hear about some random accident a thousand miles from here? He nearly bumped into the line of kids waiting to file into the library. It wasn't New York. It was Washington, D.C., another girl told them. Either way, it was far from here. So what I'd like to point out is that this usually is what happens when, you know, rumors start. You get bits and pieces of information. Some of it may be accurate. Some of it may not be. But nobody's really sure what's true. And Tommy's statement that it was a bomb in New York City, he didn't just make that up. Uh, that actually did occur, but it had occurred in 1993. And it actually did occur at the World Trade Center. So what happened was uh, in 1993, there was a Pakistani gentleman who uh, took a, a van and drove it full of explosives into the parking garage underneath the World Trade Center. Um, and ultimately he was caught two years later. So the event itself happened, um, in February of 1993, it was February 26th to be exact, but, uh, the man was caught in 1995. Uh, his name was Ramzi Youssef. And, uh, basically he was our first terrorist attack on the world trade center, uh, and he was, you know, captured by the FBI and imprisoned. And uh, as best I know, that would be where he is today. Um, but that being said, Tommy is really just as clueless as everyone else. It just may be that when he heard that there was something bad that happened in New York City, or maybe he saw a little bit of it in Mrs. Salinger's class, he remembered this actual event and kind of filled in the blanks for himself, okay? Uh, meanwhile, we have somebody else who, now he doesn't even really seem to know by name, who knows somehow that this happened in Washington, D.C. So maybe there was another teacher who had a television on or a radio on. Um, we do have a boy who in math class uh, found out that it was an airplane, okay? Uh, but ultimately, nobody has all the information, at least they got out of class and they were all standing here doing nothing, which was certainly better than having to go to P.E. The nearly 200 sixth graders poured into the library and the teacher shouted out directions. Blue group sits here. Fill in the spots up front. Everyone on the floor. No pushing. Sit still. Be quiet. Kids were talking, shifting around and slowly making their way to the carpet. At the far end by the library office, a couple of boys were balling up paper and lobbing it over onto other boys' heads, then ducking down and laughing. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary or too serious. Just a snow day in September, right? Nahid wanted to find Eliza. This would be a nice time to be nice, to sit with her and let Eliza know she was serious about being her friend. But there were so many people. It was hard to make out anyone in particular. Nahid was scanning the room for Eliza, but she began to notice the teachers standing around the outside of the circle of students, their expressions solemn. They weren't chatting with, with one another or looking for unruly boys. They were preoccupied, as they had been all morning, waiting for the principal to start talking. So the teachers are solemn. Solemn is that sad, serious expression that you'll see adults sometimes get. Uh, preoccupied. They're not paying attention to what's going on in the room. They're thinking about other things, okay? Sit down now! It was Mrs. Salinger. Her face was strange. Her makeup was smeared, and it looked like scary Halloween paint. Everyone sit and no talking! Now he decided to sit down right where she was. It was okay. She'd see Eliza later at lunch. Sitting with someone in the cafeteria was more of a statement anyway. Just a snow day in September, 
Nahid told herself again. So this seems to be the way Nahid is reassuring herself. She's kind of in denial that there's anything serious going on. Even though Mrs. Salinger looks strange, uh, you know, her, her makeup is smeared like Halloween paint. So she's been crying. Uh, the adults don't look too happy. They're not really paying attention to what's going on. Nahid, instead of allowing herself to get nervous, is trying to talk herself down. And uh, obviously that's something that, you know, in a tough situation, you might want to try. The principal was standing at the front of the room and one of the custodians was wheeling a podium across the floor. The teachers were still telling everyone to be quiet while the microphone was set up and a loud screech from the amplifiers pierced the room. The principal began. I am sure you are all wondering why we are having this unexpected assembly today. This is an unprecedented event. So there is really no, well, precedent for this. I mean to say, it is up to every school district to decide for themselves how to handle the events that have occurred. So precedent means... It happened before. Unprecedented is it has not happened before. There was the normal pushing and whispering and not paying attention. But as I have always believed in treating you students with respect, it is my policy that you should be informed. I also believe that incorrect information can lead to rumor and panic. But before I go on, I will first tell you, we have decided not to close schools today. The rest of the day will proceed on a regular schedule. I repeat, we will follow a regular school schedule and dismissal will be routine. However, all after school activities have been canceled. So before anything can get out, the principal explains the why. And the why is he doesn't want rumors and panic, okay? Uh, but the school day is going to continue once this message gets out. The noise in the room lessened. Nahid could feel her chest tighten. Maybe this wasn't a snow day or a free day or a broken septic system like the one that had closed school for a whole week last year. Something was definitely wrong. There have been three attacks on the United States this morning. Movements and the rustle of clothing, the tapping of feet, the ambient whispering suddenly stopped. One in New York City at the World Trade Center, one in Washington, D.C. on the Pentagon, and another somewhere in rural Pennsylvania. We are safe here. There suddenly wasn't enough air in the library for everyone to breathe. Nahid could feel it. She could see the principal talking and hear what he was saying, but nothing was making sense. It was like he was an actor in one of those end of the world movies. This wasn't real. So the idea that Nahid starts to feel uh, tightness in her chest, she feels like there wasn't enough air, that's panic. Panic will cause you to have shortness of breath. Panic will cause you to have an elevated heart rate. And that's what Nahid's experiencing right now. She is panicking. There is nothing to be afraid of. Some parents have called the school and are on their way to pick up their children. If your parent is one of those, you'll be notified in your classroom. Again, you will go to your regular fifth period class. Thank you. And now your teachers will direct everyone back to their classrooms. And there will be no more discussions about this until further notice. Yeah. So here's the thing, guys. Adults can say that. They can't really control that. And giving some, anybody, this kind of information is going to cause conversation. And for somebody who is as panicky as we know Nahid to be, this is definitely scaring her. As soon as the principal walked away from the podium, the noise level in the room rose like a boiling kettle that start, suddenly started to steam. Everyone began talking. A few girls started crying like those few girls will always do. Now Nahid knew for sure what Eliza had been upset about in science and why Mrs. Salinger had snapped off the television, why parents were running to school to pick up their kids. But still, it felt far away. There were things like this on the news all the time, weren't there? Bad things, scary things. Life wasn't a movie. 
It was going to be okay, wasn't it? Nahid slowly stood with the rest of her class, uncertain of what she had just been told, voices rising up around her. My grandmother lives in Pennsylvania. An attack? What does that mean? My dad lives in New York. They probably went after all those secrets stored in the Pentagon. I bet they stole all our secret files and spies and stuff. No, I heard it was a bomb. It's not a bomb. If it was a bomb, we'd all be in those underground shelter places. It's no big deal. It's not like it's a war or anything. They always want to scare us with this stuff. And so on. The students started to shuffle back to their classrooms. The gym teacher let Nahid's class have study hall, but no one was allowed to even whisper. Nahid took out her math homework and tried to concentrate, but by the end of the day, many kids had gone home, and with each one leaving, another little bit of information from the outside world got left behind. So uh, this is a little bit of a reality check because this actually did happen. Uh, as we had students who were being picked up from Suffern Middle School, even though our principal had told us not to inform the students, and the students were simply told that we were having a lockdown situation, which we had no idea even what that meant, because there was no such thing as lockdown until September 11th. Um, they didn't really understand why. They just knew that certain classes were going to be longer that day. So... As far as uh, parents coming and picking kids up, this absolutely did happen. And as that happened, uh, you know, kids were in the hallway at their lockers getting their stuff and they would see their friends and say, hey, my mom came to get me because this thing happened. And so bits and pieces of information were starting to get into our school just the way it's described here. So there's definitely an element of reality to this. Hijackers. The World Trade Center. Fire. When the bell rang for dismissal, the remaining students all poured out to the front of the school building, and with no teachers to stop them, everyone was talking. The buses sat idling with their doors wide open. People jumping to their deaths. Plane crashes. The White House evacuated. When was this end-of-the-world movie going to be over? There was Eliza standing in line, waiting to step up onto her bus, and Ahid's plan for apologizing to her seemed a hundred years in the past. It seemed like a silly speck of sand in a sandbox that was getting bigger and bigger with every frightful story that flew from parent to kid, from brother to sister, from friend to friend, from one kid to another. So we have some interesting figurative language here that what seemed so important and so significant to her that morning now seemed like a speck of sand in a sandbox, right? And the sandbox was getting bigger. So this is a simile because we have a comparison that uses the keyword like or as. Additionally, this is an example of alliteration. Seemed, silly, speck, sand, sandbox, okay? But the visual on this is, is really stunning, if you imagine it, right? That this, you know, huge mountain of regret she had about the way she treated Eliza suddenly had reduced in size to the size of a grain of sand, right? In this enormous sandbox, which was the reality of the situation they found themselves in. Air travel grounded, buildings collapsing. All at once, Nahid knew she needed to get home. She hurried along the sidewalk and found her own bus, number 15. I heard it was terrorists, the boy in the front of the line was saying. He sounded almost excited. Nahid couldn't see whom he was talking to. She could hardly hear above the sound of her own heart pounding. What do you mean terrorists? Someone else asked. Nahid could hear her own exaggerated breathing inside her head like she was inside a wind tunnel. People were starting to push to stand as close to one another as they could. Backpacks bumping. Everyone's feet taking little steps closer to the doors. Nahid felt the heat of the sun warming her hijab. She brushed away a band of sweat that formed on her brow. She tried to calm herself. Three more steps and Nahid would be on the bus. That much closer to home. Just breathe. Two more steps. She'd find a seat. Everything was going to be okay. It was Arabs. 
The voice rose above the others. One more step. Yeah, you know, Muslims, the ones with those things on their heads. Nahid didn't get on that bus. It was just after three. The sky was clear, quiet, and the bluest blue she had ever seen. Nahid stepped out of line. She hiked her backpack up over her shoulder and took off down the access road toward the elementary school. Their school got out an hour after the middle school. It was just about a half mile walk. She needed to find her sister. So my question for you is why? Why did she need to find her sister right now? Well, if you said the fact that this was what was being spread, you'd be correct. At this point, Nahid is afraid because she's afraid of hatred. What she's afraid of is a word called xenophobia. Xenophobia is a word that means a dislike or prejudice against people from other countries, cultures, or backgrounds. Okay, Xenophobia is what unfortunately happened after the September 11th attacks. And when I tell you the instances of hatred and just absolutely disgusting behavior towards people of all sorts of Middle Eastern backgrounds in the time period following September 11th was sad and it was disgusting. Um, unfortunately, this is something we're going to see play out in Nahid's section of the book. So when we see her next, we're going to hear stories about what her family has had to endure. With that being said, my friends, this is the end of section 23. Section 24 is our final section and it takes place one year later. So we'll continue.